You ever wake up with a raging blast? What's up guys, David, you're one, two, and two, and it's list day. Ah yes, list day. And today we are continuing our look at every main set of the game, the Raging Blast. It's, a, it's the, the set with the power tool dragon. Interesting thing about this set is uh, we got some Morphtronics, we got some Black Wings, and I believe this also introduced the, those immortal things. The, the Nazca line guys. So, that's neat. Anyway, if the video looks a little different, it's because I'm recording during the day and I got a new overhead light and I haven't figured out that yet. So, all the new variables. So if it looks a little whitewashed, I will try to fix it in post, but uh, that's why. But we're gonna just do it. We're just gonna do it. As with this list and with every one of the lists in this series, we're gonna do our best to look at the set by itself, but of course, if there is future support that makes certain cards good or puts them on the limited list or something, we must consider that because it's just easier that way. But without further ado, let's look at the top 10 cards in Raging Blast. Number 10 is Snowman Eater. Uh, this level three aqua monster has the following effect. If this card is flip face up, target one monster on the field that's face up and destroy it. Unlike Man Eater Bug that destroys anything, this can only destroy face up monsters. Plus, this is also not technically a flip effect because it not does it doesn't say flip in its skills. Skill is that those are those are called skills, right? As well as it doesn't say flip, colon, bleh. Uh, yeah, so you can't knock it, I guess. I'm not sure what the advantage of making this not an actual flip effect monster is, because it doesn't really work any different. Effectively, it, it functions exactly the same way. Um, I guess you can't use Nobleman of the Crosso on it to hit all the other copies. However, you also are ostracizing it from all the flip effect of support, so... I don't know, it's super weird. I don't know why you would do this. But what it does got is a big old booty. Also, I'm pretty sure the snowman eater isn't actually that snowman. I think it's that weird gremlin thing that's under the snowman that I only noticed when I made this video. <laughs> I've never really paid much attention to this card. It's a little old. That should give you kind of an idea of what the set is like. But anyway, I let's just let's just keep going. Who cares? Number nine is Morphtronic Scopin. It's like a it's like a transformer. This is the transformer archetype. And they have forms where either a little robot guy or the household item or whatever they are. And that is exemplified by the fact they have different effects if they're in attack or defense position. That's a neat card design. What's Scopin do? If it's in attack position, you can special summon another Morphtronic from your hand. It's gotta be a level four and it's destroyed during the end phase. However, this thing's a level three tuner, so it's probably not sticking around anyway. You're you're probably making like power tool dragon or, or, or something with it. So uh, yeah, we're still relatively early. We're only a couple sets in of the synchro era. You know, we're kind of getting closer to the middle, but we're still in the first half. So any of these monsters that toolbox out another monster onto the field, even though it's from your hand, which is a little clunky, means you have to have some setup, but assuming you're playing Morphtronics in a full Morphtronic deck, you probably drew two monsters, right? So like, if you opened well, so this is probably going to function, you're probably making a synchro play, that's pretty handy. This kind of inherent special summon from the extra deck is still relatively new at this point, and because it's synchro summoning, it's like the hardest one to do because your levels have to add up to something that your extra deck actually has. So you have to like toolbox the right levels and then like do math. So, you know, that's that's something that this deck actually has a tuner that does it. So it's like, it's got everything you need. And if it's in defense position, it can become level four. Since this deck's tuner can modulate its level, it means that you have a more varied extra deck and different toolboxes. That's just cool. Not to mention being a light machine is, you know, that's, that's pretty solid typing. So cool, scope it. We also got Ojama support in this set for some reason. Ojama Red was the one that we picked to be on the list because, um, why not? This little two light beast says, when it is normal summoned, you can special summon up to four Ojama monsters from your hand onto the field in attack position. Whoa, that's, uh, that's, that's like a pendulum summon before pendulum summons existed. Too bad they're all Ojamas and you can't do much with them at this point in time. However, with Ojama Country or the Fusion or something, you could make a big beater. Okay, but just the fact that you're spamming four monsters onto the board is just ridiculous. Sure, you have to have them in your hand, but the other one searches a bunch of them, so it's not impossible. It's just, you know, good field presence. You can't really take that away from Ojama Red, just because he's an Ojama. 
and then we got more support in the future so sure number nine see nine eight <laughs> eight that seems fair right it feels feels fair Number seven is Magic Plantar. Magic Plantar. Oh, why did I do that? Magic Planter is a spell card that reads, send a face-up continuous trap card to the graveyard to draw two cards. Now this would have been higher on the list uh, if it wasn't for its even card advantage and the fact that it's a little slow. You need a face-up trap card, so that means that even though this thing is a spell, it still needs to wait a turn to use it so that you can actually get a face-up trap card on the field. Plus it's a specific type of trap card, so you have to build a deck around it or put this in a deck built or it's not the most consistent draw card in the world. And that's also like kind of a an odd concept to think about, a draw card that's inconsistent. It's like, I don't want my draw card to require setup because the draw card's supposed to be getting me to my setup. That's that's like a, a catch-22, stop it. That's why we can't have Pot of Greed, because it's just so free. However, in the right deck, this card is a really nice comeback move. It's a, a great way of getting like a Call the Haunted off the field that's not doing anything anymore. So, or uh, Floodgate, maybe your maining goes in match and your opponent's and it's like game, it's game one, you didn't know what your opponent was, so you flipped it on him hoping for the best and it didn't work. So now you got this dumb floodgate that's not doing anything, so you get that off the board, because you know, whatever, you might as well. So it does definitely get rid of field waste, which is super neat, and maybe those two cards are replacing two cards that weren't helping you, so not super bad. Sit around all day, and draw pictures of dicks. What? Plus there's that fun, like, continuous trap monster deck that you can play with this and that, uh, Uriah. You're in the big pea dragon of searing peeing. Searing peeing? Ugh. You could play with gonorrhea dragon! Ew. <laughs> You're welcome for that mental image. Overall, solid card. But not the best draw card in the, in the bunch. All right, oh, finally, we are getting two cards that actually are more meta relevant, even though this is only Black Whirlwind. When you normal summon a Black Wing monster while you control this face up continuous spell card, you can search a Black Wing from your deck. It needs to have less attack than the one you summoned, but yeah, whatever. There's a, you could literally play like one copy of every Black Wing and you'd like run out of space in your deck before you hit like 60 cards. It's ridiculous. So pl trust me, you got options because you just, they just kept giving that stupid deck support. I'm not gonna use this time to crab and bitch about how the fact that we don't get support for other decks, we just keep getting heroes and black wings all the damn time. I'm not gonna make a stink about it. The worst part about this card is it's continuous, which means your opponent can negate it with like something like MST, which is really frustrating because they can just chain it to when it activates when you summon. Also, it's kind of unsearchable itself, meaning that your setup card is hard to get to to set up the rest of your deck. You really want like a search card and like a search for the search card. Woot! But, well, as much as this would have been cool if it was actually a field spell, it's still essential for the deck. At least it was for the longest time. I, I'm, not a, I'm not sure if they still use it. They, I, mean, I don't know why you wouldn't. Who cares? Regardless, it's still a really, really solid search card. And, and at this point in time, I'm pretty sure Black Wings were actually like super powerful. So there you go. Black World, Black World win. I hate Black Sonic. Ugh. All right, the top five of this set is actually pretty solid. Uh, the rest of the set's pretty mediocre, which is pretty lame. However, it seems like even the worst sets of this game have at least five cards that, you know, people actually would recognize even if they've only started just playing. So that's a thing. Good job, Konami. I guess. Trap stun. This is what happens to you when you feel that lump. <laughs> I had to make some joke. Negate all their trap effects for the rest of this turn. It's a trap card itself. Ah, a one turn of, what is it, Imperial Order? No. Royal Oppression? I don't remember. It's that continuous that negates all the other traps. It's a Jinzo for a turn. This is handy if you have traps yourself in your deck so that you don't like, like turn off all your stuff like going forward. And, you know, being that sometimes one turn turning off your opponent's stuff is all you really need, pretty solid. Relegated to a side deck card nowadays, most likely, it's still really neat. And if you activate it like during your opponent's standby phase or your own standby phase and your opponent has like some solemn space down or stuff, 
they will activate and then resolve without effect. So even though this has a less of a spell speed, if you activate it just the right time, your opponent can't activate all those pesky counter trap cards, you can still bite him in the butt with it. So that's, that's super solid. Trap's done. Good card. All right, you boyos ready for what should probably number one if uh, we didn't just adhere to the limited forbidden rules that all of these lists adhere to because I need to be at least somewhat consistent. Otherwise, um, it's just utter chaos. And that is Forbidden Chalice. Ooh, Forbidden Chalice is a quick play spell, which doesn't really matter what a quick play spell's effect is. The fact that it's a quick play spell automatically means it has a lot of inherent utility, just whether or not its effect is good or not and puts all that utility to waste. But, 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 Chalice definitely puts that quick play spell utility to some serious use. Target a face-up monster in the field until the end of the turn its effects are negated, but it gains 400 attack power. So it's like your breakthrough skill, but it gives that monster an attack boost to offset the fact that it is a spell and not a trap, making it inherently a little faster. You'd think that would be a like a neutering to the card, a nerf, but no, nah, it's actually a boon in a lot of cases. You can use it like defensively during like damage calc to raise your guy by 400 attack to surprise your opponent and get over his guy when he crashes into it. Or you can use it like offensively to turn off one of your opponent's monster effects to stop them from maybe making a play. The fact that it has two disparately different effects built into it means that it really does make a great use of that quick play status. Like I said, it's probably the best card in the set, but it's at three, so it gets bumped up to four. <laughs> I'm sorry, Chalice. Also, we're deducting points because this chick right here, she can't keep her hands off anything. I don't get it. She just, she just wants what she can't have. This, this damn, she, no wonder she's gonna get like uh, struck by lightning. She just keeps touching stuff. Keep your hands off of it. Number three is my personal favorite card in the set, one for one. It's also way at one. One for one is at one. How many times do you think I'm gonna say one in this like two minute segment? One for one is a normal spell card that says, send one monster from your hand to the graveyard to special summon one level one monster from your hand or deck. Now, for the uninitiated to the game, you might say, wow, level one's the weakest monster that you can have. Why would this thing be limited to one? I'm actually saying one a lot, and I'm not even trying to. Like, why would we care? Well, monsters of level one tend to have, like, no attack and defense. They tend to be very low. That's why they have a power level of one. However, they also tend to have really solid effects and are things like tuners and such. So, uh, toolboxing one out of your deck and giving yourself potentially some sort of graveyard setup by putting something like a Mizuki or some shenanigans in your graveyard as the cost. <laughs> Scar's really good. Plus, it tutors my turtle out of my deck. I wish this was at three. It's probably degenerate to be at three. For the good of the game, it should probably be a Saki one of, but I can, I can dream. I can dream. One. <laughs> Number two is Deep Sea Diva. Deep Sea Diva is a weird one. She probably could have been three and one for one could have been two. Uh, uh, uh. It's hard to say because like Deep Sea Diva has been in competitive mermails for a very, very long time. So she's got a lot of success. Issue is, I think at this point in time when she came out, there wasn't really much you could do with her except make a cheesy synchro play for like that dragon that came out in this set. I think. And like special summoning a level three or lower sea serpent monster from your deck has like zero good targets at this point. It's like a bunch of like obscure vanillas and bad crap like that. Man, there might, wait, do we have Atlanteans at this point? I don't even think so. But yeah, so like at the time she had like cruddy targets, but now she's got all the targets in the world and has a home in a really good deck, so take that one as you will. But like, as we said before, a tuner monster, now at this point, tutoring a monster out of the deck, and not just the hand, is like, really, really solid for your synchro summoning. So I, uh, I actually got a new mechanic for you. Oh yeah? What's it called? It's called, uh, synchro summoning. Oh! How does that work? Well, we have these new monsters called tuner monsters. Yeah. And you can special summon inherently a monster from your extra deck, as long as you have a monster on your field and a tuner monster and their levels equal the monster on the uh, on the extra deck card. Oh, 
Uh, that sounds like it'd be really difficult. Oh, it's actually gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh? Yeah, we'll just have the tuner monsters summon something from the deck. Oh wow, any excuse. She's a really solid card and uh, she's like a wine. She's got better with time. Hey. And for the honorable mentions, the first one we have is Alien Dog. Much spaceship, very probe, wow. Alien Doge is an interesting card because um, kind of follows that theme that we've had this whole video. It's tough summoning other stuff when you summon stuff. If you normal summon alien, you can special summon this thing from your hand, then put two A counters on monsters your opponent controls. Woot. So it gets you some board presence, it, it forwards your game state by putting those stupid alien counters on stuff, and presumably, you know, you might be playing, uh, what was it, Ammonite or whatever? The alien tuner, you try to make Golgar or whatever you're trying to do. Neat. It's what you want to do. Pretty sure you can make Golgar, I think the tuner is a two, or is the tuner a one? It might be a one. I think you can play it like in blue eyes, right? Oh God, I don't remember, but it gets you crap on board. What do you want from me? The other honorable mention is Mirror of Oaths. It's, it's a trap card. When your opponent special summons a monster from the deck, you can destroy that monster and then draw a card. It's gotta be main deck, so you can't use it against like, you know, a synchro summon. Lame. But summoning from the main deck seems to be a theme this list. So when this came out, it was probably all right. And like even nowadays, like summoning stuff from the main deck is cheesy and, and annoying and gets cards banned like, invoker so it definitely still happens nowadays and most good decks can like you know cheese something out of their main deck so it's probably never too dead and a normal trap card means you could probably get it with like trap trick that's cute so it's a side deck card at best but it is good card advantage that's a thing but it's just unsearchable mostly and kind of obscure it won't see any play but it's <laughs> It's actually really not bad. It just it's a little specific in what it requires your opponent to do. And then the dishonorable mention is uh, this this stupid thing. Earthbound Immortal, um, oh boy. Kapak apu kapak apu kapak apu It's a pack of poo The Earthbound Immortal techniques are uh, at least interesting concept designs. They're all based on the Nazca lines in Mexico that like came to life or whatever. I didn't watch 5Ds very much, so I'm assuming there's some anime lore behind these things, but that's kind of cool, I guess. I think this is the Spaceman one. And all the Earthbound Immortals have this dumb effect where they can be the only one on the field and they kill themselves by card effect if you don't have the spell, uh, spell, bleh, a field spell card. So they're like a crappy malefic that you have to like normal summon. <laughs> and they can attack your opponents, uh, they can attack directly. I'm pretty sure they all also can do that. And then they all have the specific effects. In this one's case, if this thing killed something by battle, you can do burn damage to your opponent equal to the attack power of what you killed, which is like really dumb and flies in the face of its other effect where it can attack directly. Like, it is 3K. Why would you s smash into a monster when you can just attack directly and, you know, avoid effects and things? I don't know. It's a lot of work to summon this stupid thing all for a big beat stick. I don't know. It's not really worth the effort. It's cool design though, I guess. And before we get to number one, today's sponsor is MetaMats. Why wouldn't it be? If you guys want a custom cloth playmat, go to their website and use the promo code TROLLMETA and you get 10% off. It helps the channel, helps them, helps it helps the world and the economy, I, I guess. And you can get a cloth playmat, like one of them Spellgrounds type deals. Put an image on it. Put your favorite waifu on it. Go for it. And number one is the band card, so it has to be number one, which is annoying because I don't think it's actually... <laughs> well, okay. Pheno Phoenixian Cluster Amaryllis. It's a level eight plant with 2200 attack and zero defense. It's a fiery attribute, that's interesting. Phoenix, I guess, right? Why would this thing be banned? I have no idea. Well, what does it do? This can't be special summoned except by its own effect or this Phoenixian seed card. Whatever. If this card attacks, destroy it after damage calc, regardless of what happened. Okay, who cares? If this card you control is destroyed instead of the graveyard, do uh, do 800 damage to your opponent. Uh, burn damage. Cool. During your end phase, you can banish one uh, one plant from your graveyard to special summon this thing from the graveyard to the field in defense position. Now that sounds really clunky and bad. Why would this ever be banned? Well, uh, it's not once per turn, and I believe the combo was with uh, Topological Bomber Dragon. Basically, you just keep summoning this thing from your graveyard uh, into a, a zone that Bomber Dragon points to. Bomber Dragon blows it up, and then, you know, puts this thing back in the graveyard to resummon it, you know, do the 800 damage, blow it up again, blah, 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 until you, you know, as long as you have a bunch of crap in your graveyard, which are probably like, you're playing plants, so it's probably like a bunch of Lone Fire Blossoms or some cheese, you can just do a bunch of, just a bunch of burn damage. And a burn loop card 
uh, yeah, it's, it's, I can see why you'd ban it. It's not, it's not a hard once per turn. I don't know why they just don't rot of it. Like, would anyone care if this got a hard once per turn? I know, but whatever. Factory number one, a space weed. Sweet. Anyway, guys, that was a uh, raging boner. It's a, uh, it's an interesting set. It's oh, it's okay. Rest in pepperonis there, power tool dragon. You didn't make it. You're kind of bad. But anyway, guys, let me know what you guys think of the list. Um, it was certainly one we had to get out of the way. <laughs> and remember, guys, if you don't troll the better well, I will see you guys next time. Well, looks like they made it through the video. But you'd still be a slacker if you didn't subscribe up there. Maybe you should check out one of these other videos. Maybe then you'd actually be a decent opponent for me.